As soon as the last word left her mouth, I snapped inside. I squeezed my eyes shut tight and shook my clenched fists once more. The vat of lemonade exploded, sending yellow liquid and shards of glass in every direction. I opened my eyes to see what I had done. When the vat broke and the lemonade went everywhere, it had bowled her over and knocked her to the ground. She was drenched in sticky, sugary lemonade. I had made sure that all the other customers and any passers-by had all miraculously been spared being hit. After all, there was no need for anyone else to suffer because of her. She was soaked, dripping from her hair to her fingertips, and as she struggled to get back up, Lemonade had started pooling around her shoes. I shrugged and declared, When life hands you lemons, then turned around and left her on the ground. Waka waka. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to this next meeting of St. Balasar University's English Club. I'm Andrew. And I'm Charles Spellman. And today we have something really exciting for you. We have Lanny Serum's Handbook for Mortals. As you guys know, this is a podcast where we take a look at books that the internet has written off and we give them a fair shake, something that every writer deserves. That's right. Our goal isn't to make fun of the books that everyone else already hates, but to find something to love in them. Find the magic. The magic is in me, Charles <laughs> Spellman. Okay. <laughs> Fun fact, Charles, this book is actually the reason I wanted to start the English Club in the first place. Lanny, you have been lambasted by the internet, but I think that was incredibly unfair and it breaks my heart seeing all these people be so mean to you because everyone who wants to be a novelist has written Handbook for Mortals. They've written their own self-insert, real from the heart, wish fulfillment thing. And I, I know that you know you have this movie deal that you were trying to work out, but I know in my heart of hearts that this isn't a cash grab or at least isn't just a cash grab because too much of you is in this and there's all these clever bits that we're going to get into you're really into tarot and magic in real life and did you say magic i did say magic i charles spellman love magic and it's just not generic enough to make me think that it was a cash grab charles i'm sure you're aware that there was a little bit of an illusion that took place when uh lanny or people associated with her bought the book on Moss in order to inflate the sales numbers in the New York Times bestsellers list. Yes, the old switcheroo, we call it. In the industry. It's an old industry secret. Shh, don't tell anyone. But famously, this did displace the hate you give. It, it, it's a really bad situation, but when you write a book, and maybe this is something that only weirdo writers think about, but when you when you write a book, when you create something, it kind of becomes your child. Parents tend to break rules for their children. And I just, I wanted to give your book, Lanny, a fair shake. I wanted to put you among the ranks of Norman Bouton and Will, thanks, thanks for coming back, Will, for books that people have written off. But I know that there's a lot of good in this and I'd really love to dive into it with you guys. Yeah, it's true. Um, sorry, I kicked Charles out of the room. He was like annoying me with how slow he talked. We're not gonna excuse uh, perhaps some of the questionable things that Lonnie did in order to uh, boost the reputation of her book, but the book itself, its its content, irrespective of the author and the circumstances surrounding it, is, uh, I think, worth examining. We will be killing the author. Sorry. Sorry, Lanny. We should have told you that before uh, you came in here. So yeah, without further ado, let's dive into a quick summary so we know what goes on in Lanny Sarum's Handbook for Mortals. So it opens on Zade, who's the only daughter of a wizard mother living in a small conservative town uh, in Tennessee. It's called Centertown. Uh, she gets into a fight with her mom, and she runs away from home to join a famous magic show in Las Vegas. So when she's auditioning for this theater, the Charles Spellman Theater, 
she does this amazing trick where she jumps into a stage of fire and then the fire becomes water and she miraculously emerges and it's completely unexplained and she's a real magician. Within the company are a slew of men, uh, Mac, the love interest being one of them. All of them have three letter names and some of them are just inverses of each other. There's Mac, Cam, and Tad, and then Sophia, a young woman who resents Zaid for her talent or just resents Zaid to create conflict in the book. And it's noted that she is in a relationship with Charles Spellman, at least casually. Immediately, she meets the two love interests of the story, Mac, mm -hmm. who works on the theater tech side of the show, and Jackson, who plays in the house band, and he's also a member of the Plain White Tees, like the actual real Plain White Tees. Um, he's not a real person, though. He's like a fictional member of the band that uh, Lanny invented. He's like the forgotten brother of the Jonas Brothers. Uh, Gibby? <laughs> yes, Gibby! So this essentially marks the beginning of the middle of the novel. Um, I say middle, but that's actually like 300 or 400 pages of it. The middle essentially consists of these like cycling scenes where Zayd tries to date both Mac and Jackson at the same time, but without fully committing to the either so that she doesn't feel like she's cheating and they don't feel like they're being cheated on. She also is like either practicing or performing at the magic show at regular intervals. And she does random activities around Vegas like a tourist like she rides motorcycles in the desert she goes camping she goes to the mall mm -hmm. and visits a few like real actual well-known clubs in Vegas there's a few notable episodes in the middle that I think are worth pointing out so before one date Zade goes to the mall where she runs into the literal actual carrot top and has a brief conversation with them they act like they know each other but they've apparently never met before and they never meet again it was like running into an old co-worker at the grocery store. But you're constantly thinking of Carrot Top, so it becomes this horrific scene. Yeah, where she's just exchanging pleasantries with this now sort of forgotten celebrity. Minutes later, she's in the parking deck, leaving the mall, and she's attacked by another girl with magical powers, who, other than her mother, is the first uh, magic practitioner we've seen in the book up to that point. Um, the girl, like, kind of gets the better of Zade, but then Zade manages to fight her off, and then the girl gets into a Lamborghini and drives away, and is not seen again for the rest of the novel. The entirety of the novel. Then there's another scene where Zade gets into a fight with a, a teenage uh, worker at a lemonade stand, because Zade is allegedly hitting on the girl's boyfriend who also works at the stand. Instead of handling it like an adult, Zade freaks out and behaves like a literal child and makes a, a frozen lemonade explode all over the girl and embarrasses her publicly. There's also a moment where a careless cyclist comes too close to Zade and Mac as they are on a date. In retaliation for this, Zade causes the biker to vault over the handlebars to and become injured because of this, and there's no repercussion or follow-up. There's a lot of weird instances like this where Zade is just sort of randomly mean, but she's not the only one because Mac is manipulative on multiple occasions. He frequently accuses Zaid of cheating on him, despite her being pretty clear that they're not actually dating. And then he starts abruptly acting like everything is okay. Um, and it, this just continues. It's like a classic, classically toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's revealed one time and never really comes up again that Mac's real name is Clark Kent, like Superman. It would honestly be better to call him that because his name is just another three-letter word that is interchangeable with all the rest of the crew, but it shows up and they're pet names for each other. Zade calls Mac Superman and Mac calls her uh, Magic Girl, which I thought was kind of cute. Meanwhile, her relationship with Jackson kind of falls by the wayside by the end of the novel and is just sort of forgotten about um, until it's just not really a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. It's important to note that Mac and Zaid initially hated each other because Mac, working on the technical side of things, needs to know how the illusions work for safety reasons. So the fact that Zaid refuses to reveal the secret that she actually has magic, there's a little bit of a conflict there and it becomes particularly childishly nasty. They, they tend to snarl and growl at each other in the dialogue tags until Mac happens upon her in a state of undress in a dressing room, and that just 
completely fixes everything. And that's also never addressed. Yeah, it's really good stuff. For no particular reason, the end of the novel begins when Zade starts working on this particularly risky magic trick that draws on something called chaos magic, which has never been mentioned before and is never explained. She injures herself during the show where she's performing this chaos magic trick and has to be taken to her mom for healing. Uh, Charles and Mac accompany her on the journey home while she's in a coma. And while she's in a coma, it's revealed that Charles Spellman, who runs the magic act that she's performing in, and her mom were once a couple, and that Charles is Zade's father. Uh, this It doesn't really matter, it just kind of is a thing that happens. There's a flashback sequence explaining how Charles met Zade's mom, and it literally doesn't matter. As proof, I did not read it, I skipped that entire section just to see if I would miss anything, and fun fact, I did not. The important information is that they met each other, and they fell in love, and they had Zade, mm-hmm. and then they split up. So this reveal that Charles Spellman is Zade's father kind of changes a lot of things in retrospect in the earlier parts of the book, especially Zaid and Sophia's rivalry. Sophia, on no uncertain terms, has referenced the fact that she has been having sex with Charles Spellman um, graphically for the book, and Zaid kind of just lets this happen, despite the fact that she knows that Charles is her father. There's a scene fairly early on in the book when Charles summons Zaid into her office to talk about something, and then it just kind of fades to black. Mm -hmm. And then later, Zaid and Charles talk, you know, alluding to this fact that they both know, but that the reader doesn't know. Um, And then it turns out at the end that that fact is that uh, Charles is Zaid's dad, And I just don't understand the reason for hiding this from the reader, but giving that information to the character. It's like totally robs you of an opportunity to have some dramatic irony. Mm -hmm. And it also just makes things really confusing. For a first person narrative, it's almost impossible to do something like this. And we see the effects of this firsthand with with this reveal. Yeah, it makes the, the reader feel like they're being left out which I don't think is something you want to do Mm -hmm. in a YA novel like this that's going for a generally sort of snacky, fun tone. Right. As part of the ritual to heal Zade, Mac has to drive a magic dagger into her heart for reasons. Um, He fears it will kill her, and this is really built up like he's scared, doesn't trust in the magic dagger. And then, of course, he stabs her and it doesn't kill her. It just revives her and everything's fine. So then the novel ends with the marriage of Charles and Zade's mom. Zade catches the bouquet during the bouquet toss, and uh, the novel's final words are, and they all lived happily ever after, and then this next part in all caps, or do they? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about love is that love doesn't care if you've labeled it or not. And it also doesn't care if there might be someone else vying for the person you love. Jealousy might, but not love. You can love someone who doesn't even know you really exist. Love really knows no boundaries, and sometimes it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. You can wish it away all you want, but just like Cupid's arrow, once you've been hit, you've been hit. So, my dear boy, Andrew, Tell me something that you liked about Lanny Serum's Handbook for Portals. I think the best thing for me when reading this book was the setting. The Las Vegas magic world was really neat to me. And the fact that it clearly came from the author's experience added a lot to the authenticity of it. It was it was the best kind of self-insert you can do because there's all these little idiosyncratic moments. Like, who thinks that show blacks are sexy? That's such a weird thing that I would never think about. But if you're involved in the theater world, if you're involved in the performance world a lot, that's that's what you're exposed to. Yeah, I actually completely agree. And I had also made a note of almost that exact same point. You can really tell that Lanny made an effort to get specific and use like grounding details in the plot to add some authenticity and to put the reader in the moment. The show Blacks one is better than the example that I pulled. Um, But like she also talks about like the mechanics of how rehearsals work and how many times a week they perform and she names some real life places that she's like very obviously been to and i think that adds like an authenticity you can't get any other way right and even in other ways that transcend the setting lanny the person does enjoy magic she does enjoy tarot card reading and motorcycles all of these things show up in the book and there are parts where it really shines, especially the tarot card reading 
the way the way she talks about it and the way that um, it's presented was actually kind of interesting to me. That's one of my favorite parts was just watching Zade come up with the the fortunes through the tarot cards. Yeah, that was interesting, that scene where she tries to read her own fortune. And so uh, it, it was also a little bit enlightening because I, I don't know too much about tarot cards myself, but all of the chapters in this book are named after tarot cards. And the reason this is, is because each one is associated with their own numbers. Sure, it's something small, but having that little touch of personality really created a work that could only be Lanny Serums, and I think in that regard she succeeds. I'm totally with you on the tarot card chapters thing. That's the kind of thing that elevates a really good novel to a really great novel, mm -hmm. or in a less great novel, stands out as a very cool idea. <laughs> Something else I thought was fun was that Tad and Mac have a pretty good realistic male friendship. They, they had all these little banter moments that you could really tell that like these two guys had worked together for a while and they're, they, they, they butted heads, but they respected each other. And it was, it was just something really nice to see, especially since a lot of the characters got pit against each other for various reasons in this book. Um, but doesn't Tad catch Mac peeping on Zade and then not really do anything about it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's hard because it's like, Lanny, are you going for this old fashioned, like, oh, this is so scandalous, this peeping Tom, or are we really supposed to be kind of skeeved out? I, I wonder what your in intention was there. Yeah, because there's, there's a good opportunity there for the book to come down on one side or the other and say, you know, that's a very uncool, um, not just of Mac, but of Tad for not intervening. Like, that's exactly the kind of place where a really good friend should intervene in his friend's actions and say, like, what you're doing is not very cool at all. But he doesn't. Yeah, I forgot that was Tad in the in, in the Peeping Tom scene, because all the characters' names look the same. That's my bad. It's your Tad? It's my Tad. <laughs> Sorry, dude, my Tad. Well, as we say in the South, bless your heart, and, uh, thanks for the advice, or whatever you're calling it, but we are just friends. If I was after him, as you've stated, then I promise you I would have better luck than either of you. After the words came out of my mouth, I was actually surprised that I'd been so bold to both of them. I was proud of myself, though. I stood and stared back at them, waiting for their response. Zaid, one. Stupid girls, zero. So let's flash forward a little bit. Um, Zayd and Max's first little romantic encounter where they're riding their bikes through the desert and they get caught in a freak storm. And there's this really tender moment where they kind of cuddle up next to each other. That made my heart flutter. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. You're lying right now. No, I, I swear. I swear I was reading that. I was like, aw, that's kind of cute. Straight people romance. <laughs> It made me support Tad as, you know, the, the love interest over Jackson, like, instantly, just because it was, they had... You mean Mac? Yes, I mean Mac. It, ma it made me support Mac over Jackson instantly, just because they had these moments where you could really feel like a burgeoning romance. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I was sort of on Team Jackson, so I wasn't really feeling this, because Mac is, like, a little creepy. Well, we'll get, I mean, we already named one thing, but we can get more into that later. Were you Team Jackson? Yeah, totally. Why? I mean, he's obviously cuter. <laughs> okay. Okay. Another thing I liked um, on the face of it was actually the title. I mean, Handbook for Mortals is a fantastic title. Like, there's really there's really no way around that. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't really have anything to do with the book, except for this vague mention at the end that um, I almost said Lanny, <laughs> but I meant Zade is going to write a book um, that's going to help mortals, like, as a guide to the magical world. But yeah, just on the face of it, Handbook for Mortals... A plus title. If I had seen this on a shelf as a teen, I would have at least picked it up. Absolutely. And I mean, the cover is really cool too. Uh, Google it if you haven't seen it, but it's got Zade, and we we can tell it is Zade because it has her her signature hairstyle with the three interwoven colors. She's blindfolded. She's got a rose in her mouth. She's sitting in front of a target with a bunch of knives in it. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's really badass. It's a little manic pixie dream girl, but like it's cool. It's it's cool in like a classic Harley Quinn kind of way. Do you want me to ruin it for you? 
Uh, sure. That's stolen art. No! <laughs> yeah, there was a, there's some, like, independent online artist who drew something very similar, and they, they took it, and then they drew it with Zade-like elements. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. Sorry. Uh, I man. Le- I, Lainey, I don't know if that was you or your company, but that's really bad. That's bad people stuff. That was, yeah, that's something villains do. Um, it was that's something probably, villains do. Probably Geek Nation that was behind that. I doubt Lanny was trolling Google images looking for things that could be traced. <laughs> she doesn't strike me as the sort. Oh, well, well, it's it's too late now. And Lanny, we're not going to harp on your your controversies because like we said, it's it, it it's just a weird situation and a lot of mistakes were made on a lot of different people's parts. And in the end, the hate you give did end up still managing to become a hallmark of modern young adult literature and literature in general. So, mm-hmm. the good guys won out, I would say. Another thing I liked was the way the book opens. The premise is strong from the outset. Girl runs away to join a famous magic act, but the twist is she's actually magic. The magic act is not, and she has to perform magic without being caught. Yeah. Like, that's, it's a high concept premise. Like, that would sell. Yeah, that is, that's, that has all the elements of really good fiction. Something about keeping magic secrets from people really resonates with a younger audience. I mean, it resonates with me. Yeah, a younger audience. (laughs) So that the ending with Mac as like the hapless boyfriend going along with Zade's parents in this crazy magic ritual to bring her back to life was so compelling to me as a premise. Obviously, it was undermined a little bit by the flashback about how Zade's parents met, but just the idea of this like normal guy completely flabbergasted trying to decide whether or not to put a dagger in his girlfriend's heart was just so funny to me and a great use of like a fish out of water. It reminded me a lot of that Harry Potter scene where Harry and Dudley are attacked by Dementors and it's like Dudley's first encounter with actual magic and his life is at risk. Mm -hmm. And I I just remember really being scared of that scene, like reading it as a kid, because I could imagine, you know, in that situation, what if I was in that situation and there was no Harry there to save me, you know, like you would die. You would just straight up be killed. And so it's easy to to empathize with a character like Mac in that situation because he's totally in over his head. Mm -hmm. Sorry to reference turf literature. Um, I respect this novel for subverting a common YA trope and having the main character's parents both be alive and also active players in the plot. It's like pretty common for young adult novels to just kill off or otherwise remove the parents. Uh, For instance, Empress Teresa, which touted itself as a young adult novel, did just sort of remove the parents from the plot. And the reason, you know, is obviously that it's easier for a kid to have an adventure if there aren't these authority figures getting in the way at every step. So conceptually, I like that idea. Young adult novel, parents are in the picture, play a role in the story. In terms of execution, it's not fantastic, but, you know, the idea is there. I never thought about that. You're totally right. It it makes the last bit of the novel really nice. Like I it, it albeit gratuitous, the scene the with the wedding between Charles and Dela was cute and it was nice to see her parents getting along. Yeah, I'm not sure that that sets the best example for what people in broken homes should aspire to be. You know, I don't know if I really can get behind the idea that you know, if you don't get along, you should stay together because it makes your kid happy. Like, oh, no, no, that's, no, no. that's okay. not a great message. But yeah, you're right. I mean, in the context of this novel, it, it creates a cute scene. So this is honestly more of a bad thing than a good thing. But I really like the chicks formerly known as the Dixie Chicks. And the, the song that was quoted is one of my favorite songs by them. So I kind of let that slide when I read it. Otherwise, it would have made me very upset. But you know, it made me think of a song I liked, so you get points, Slanny. Yeah, um, I think copious references or allusions is something we can talk about later. There's a lot of them. There's so many of them. And they're a bit alienating for a young adult audience. <coughs> Carrot Top. <laughs> Carrot Top. Who has spared a thought for Carrot Top in the past two decades? You know why guys fawn over you and some girls can't stand you? She continued as I gathered up my bags. Even mortals can sense power. At that, I stopped and set my bags down again. I stared at her. She grinned, but not kindly. They don't know what it is, but I do. You should shield yourself better. But then again, it's so strong. 
She raised her eyebrows with a look of amazement on her face. Do you even know how powerful you are? I pulled myself up to my full height and glared, hoping my voice didn't reflect how shaken I was. Who are you? That's not for you to know, yet. You will know when it's time. Until then though, I'd love to test your power. With that, she marched to the other side of the parking garage and put about 30 feet of distance between us. She turned around and nodded her head at me. What do you mean? I asked, feeling my muscles clench. This. She raised her hands to her head and closed her eyes. She was silent for a moment, and then she thrust her hands towards me. Suddenly, I was slammed back against the wall of the building with what felt like enough force to ground a plane. I grimaced in pain. I could feel bruises already rippling on the back of my head, spine, and arms. Come on, girl. Show me what you can do. She yelled, something like a mix of anger and glee in her voice. Stop it, I winced. It hurt even to get the words out. Make me. My body was still pressed against the wall. It felt like I was being held in place by hurricane force winds. I screwed my eyes shut, fighting against the excruciating pain to bring my arms together in front of me. My back was still locked to the wall, but at least I was now able to bring my hands together. I cupped them into a sphere and shoved them in the direction of the girl, who stood watching with an egocentric smirk. Colored sparks of light shot forward from between my palms, sending the girl flying backward and slamming into the garage wall. Strips of tinted fire marked the ground, showing the path the sparks had taken to hit her. Released from her hold, I fell to the ground. I gingerly pushed myself up to my hands and knees before standing. The girl stood, too, dusting herself off. She laughed again. <laughs> You did that, and you barely even know what you're doing. She said, shaking her head. Amazing. Well, Zaid, I'll see you around. So, Joshua, we talked a little bit about what's going well. Do you want to talk about maybe some of its weaknesses? I don't know who Joshua is. I'm Charles Spellman, and I have lots to say about the magic system in Handbook for Mortals. Someone get him out of here! Charles, Jesus, get out of here, man! Okay, I'll see you later. Okay, um, sorry about that, guys. He just... So, the rules kind of come and go without consistency. I feel like it'd be better for there to either be a hard magic system or a soft magic system, and it should be a soft magic system because those are better. I don't like how you even say that there are rules, because it seems so arbitrary to me in terms of what can and cannot be done. Or actually, just what can be done. There were no limitations placed on the magic. Now, I won't say the MS word because I feel like some people might find that a little bit too trendy, but... MS Paint? Yeah, MS Paint. <laughs> but we should we should have limitations. We should know... So, so Zaid can turn fire into water, and she can build a tent without even touching it. What can she not do? So... What's to stop her from becoming Empress Teresa and moving continents around? So what you're saying is that there should not be a magic system, but that there should be some sort of system what governs the magic in this book? My eyes glaze over when you say capital M-S magic system, but yes, yes, there should be. Okay, well, rest assured that I'm saying magic system with a lowercase m and a lowercase s. Okay, um, okay, in that case. I just, I, I agree with you that, yeah, there needs to be some kind of rules. We touched on chaos magic a minute ago, so that might be a good place to start. It's introduced only moments before it comes into play. Um, and then it ends up being like a driving force in the last quarter of the book, mm -hmm. which seems wrong. Um, I know you had some thoughts on that. We could have had some other point kind of earlier in the novel where she just is telling us about magic and she's like, oh, I have X, Y, Z power and I could do chaos magic if I wanted to, but I don't want to mess with that because that's scary. You're kind of just dropping something on us and then instantly using it rather than kind of letting it germinate throughout the story and that that just kind of made it feel cheap especially since 
there's not much of a motivation for her to use chaos magic. Yeah, I mean, she did start off the novel by turning water or turning fire into water. Was it water into fire? Oh, an element turned into another element. She did begin the novel by transmuting an element into another element. So, like, it raises the question of why she can easily do that, but she can't do whatever chaos magic is. Well, because it's dangerous. Yeah, but, like, why? There's no answer. You, so you asked a minute ago, what can't magic do? Yeah. And there is one thing that Zade doesn't seem to be able to do with it, at least, and that's tell the future. Because when she does the tarot reading for herself, she gets these very vague and inconclusive sort of results. So, like, we know she can't just see the future but we don't really know why that's fair but also there's a lot of, I, I i'm more being physical here like what what can she physically not do you're seeing the future is one thing but if you can summon elements and make lemonade vats explode where where does it end yeah i think you're right and i think an easy fix well you know relatively easy fix would be to introduce some sort of lowercase s system mm -hmm. where magic at least expends energy like proportionate to the effect that it achieves sure so making a lemonade thing explode probably not a lot of effort maybe zade feels a little hungry afterwards but in order to fight off a magical teenager in the parking garage of a mall and shooting a big rainbow fire beam at her that like scorches the pavement that seems like the kind of thing that i don't know maybe you would pass out after doing right yeah and but that's really all that it would require. I got kind of excited during the tent building scene because I was like, okay, here is a contained scene of magic being used. She could be like, oh, I drew on this energy, which has this repercussion and this consequence, which would be enough for me. And there's there's moments this can be peppered. Yeah, I mean, this isn't Dungeons and Dragons. No, no, this doesn't need to be like, if she starts putting numbers on this, I'm going to be irate. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we when I say magic system, I don't I mean, like we either need it uses some physical components to do magic or it requires some kind of combination of speech and movement to do magic or it requires some kind of energy that the that the author conveys is being expended when magic is done. Yeah, I, I also don't want numbers attached, just some sort of like intuitive standard for mm -hmm. when she does this much magic, she feels this way afterwards. Right. Yeah, yeah. Segwaying into fake magic, I know that we've said that Lanny has a connection to Las Vegas performances in general, but every single magic act was insanely weird to me. And I don't know if that was the narration, but it definitely wasn't for the last illusion that used chaos magic when like a, a tree was fallen and a guy who looks like a younger version of Charles Spellman pops out and eats an apple and dies and lights on fire. Like, I was trying to imagine like being in the audience looking at that stage and I could not see it. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. The stage performance scenes, they, they border on over-described, I think, to the point where it just gets confusing and hard to visualize. That last one in particular with the chaos magic is weird because it feels like it's trying to be symbolic somehow but then it's not really explained or addressed again. It just kind of happens. So about the people that are related to the performance, I know you're Team Jackson Joshua, and I need you to defend your point because he was such a non-entity nice guy, and it weakened the love triangle. I know some people hate love triangles on principle. I don't care what I'm reading as long as it's entertaining, and when there's a leg of the triangle that doesn't stand on its own, it undermines the entire conflict for me and makes me just wonder Listen why. Listen to this pleb over here that wants to be entertained by literature. Come on. I mean, get a load of this guy. <laughs> I know this is a crazy idea. I know this is a crazy idea because we, we interact so regularly with, with heady, erudite texts such as Empress Teresa and Trigger Warning, you know, things that are completely unfunny and just really make you question the nature of existence. But sometimes, damn it, I want to be entertained. And I don't think that's wrong to ask for. No, not wrong. Just sort of, a, I don't know, plebeian. This is why I'm not an English major. Yeah, I mean, God, imagine being an English major. <laughs> that would suck. How would you even get a job? That's what I want to know. Answer me that, English majors. Who's going to employ you, huh? <laughs> yeah, didn't think of that, did you? You never heard that one before, I bet. <laughs> well, I think I liked him uh, mainly by virtue of him not being Mac. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> um, just because... 
Mac is creepy. I mean, for the reasons that I outlined. He's childish. Plot summary. Yeah. Like you said, he's childish. And like I was saying, he does this like weird little song and dance routine where he'll be like, oh, Zade, you were totally cheating on me, even though they're not in a relationship. Right. And then he'll act like everything is fine. And then Zade is like, oh, well, I guess we're cool again. And then the whole thing just repeats. Right. And it's the kind of thing that makes you want some self-awareness on the part of your protagonist. Mm -hmm. Also, Jackson, I don't know. He just seems like he'd be cuter, you know, <laughs> like he's in a band and he has a sense of humor. He's not abusive. He's in a band. Okay. Well, you have very, very impossible standards for men, I think. Yeah, I guess non-abusive men. Those are hard to come by <laughs> these days. <laughs> the thing about Charles being her dad is that it, it kind of adds nothing. I would actually argue that it, <laughs> it detracts from the plot by removing a potential source of conflict. Mm -hmm. Like, if he's constantly, like, suspecting that something about her is weird and trying to figure out what it is... This doesn't have to be the main conflict of the story, but sure. it would make even her workplace where she goes to, to flee to safety from, I don't know, whatever other complexities are going on in her life, a, a source of, of conflict for her. And I mean, in general, I think more conflict is a good thing. I, I cannot I cannot state how creepy it makes it that we are in Zayd's head. She's talking to us and we're existing through her eyes. Sophia, the mean girl of the magic company, makes specific references like she, she was literally like oh i was on top of him and zayd doesn't react to this the way that a woman would if a, another woman her age were talking about having sex with her father and she knows it's her dad at this point too right because right. they've already had that that off-camera conversation exactly so so for all of this just to be withheld was weird was really weird and i and i hated it so much it is weird, and I think it, it circles back to something you were saying earlier about how it's clear that Lanny is someone who's who's read a lot of books before but doesn't quite grasp the finer points. Like, she gets that it's a good thing to occasionally withhold key information from the reader. Mm -hmm. um, she, she clearly gets that dramatic irony is a thing, but she, like, gets it backwards. Yeah, backwards is a really good way to put it. Th there's no way around this, so I can't really tell you another way to do it, but... Zade's in a coma, her life's at risk, but we know that she survives because she overtly tells us before the flashback even begins. You know, I know it's hard to kill off a first-person narrator anyways, but any chance we had a suspension of disbelief was a little bit ruined by that. Yeah, the fact that the main character, the point-of-view character, the only point-of-view character is in a coma for like, I don't know, a fifth of the book... That just doesn't strike me as a good choice. I mean, it forces you to have other perspective characters. And at the 11th hour, I don't know that introducing another perspective character is a good idea. Right. I mean, anything has the potential to work. I feel like that's something we stand for here on sure. English Club is that anything can work. It's all in the execution. But some things are prohibitively difficult. Yeah. And I think in this case, uh, having us randomly be in a new perspective at chapter 20 out of 25 is prohibitively difficult to to make it work. This is relatively minor and something I tend to be an apologist for because I don't care if allusions to real life things are made, but there are way too many allusions to real life things to the point it's really uncomfortable. I don't like that the plain white tees are characters in this book, however much of a non-entity they are and however much of a real relationship that Lanny may or may not have with them. It, it was just weird. Yeah. And and there, I'd almost prefer, uh, there was some like off-color joke made about like the in-sync boys and the, the old boys on the curb. And they would just like butcher boy bands as a joke. I, I would prefer that being like real to actual real characters that are also human beings on this earth. Yeah. Um, as I was reading this, I had started to compile a list of all of the allusions or references to either properties or real life people that there are mm -hmm. and after chapter five i had to give up because it became so prohibitive to my reading because i'd have to stop like constantly and be like oh there's in sync oh there's the plain white tees oh there's the dixie chicks oh there's carrot top like it joffrey is just baratheon a superman like, it was just annoying. Guys, what is it about you? It, that was in Empress Teresa, that was in Trigger Warning, and now it's in Handbook for Mortals. Like, why Why is the common factor of all of these 
gratuitous references to pre-existing things. Wait, what does trigger warning reference? Die Hard. Okay, but like that's in like structure. That's not. And they also mention it. They also talk about it. They did. Yes, I promise you. Uh, this isn't a bit. Was it during the date? No, it's not during the date. It's um like when Matthias and uh and Jake were facing off. Are you sure it's not in the date? Are you sure that Natalie wasn't like, hey, by the way, Jake, have you ever seen Die Hard? That's. T- I'm positive that didn't happen, Joshua. We read... Oh, you're right, because she didn't talk during the date. It was all just Jake dumping his backstory on her. <laughs> this is about Lanny. We Lanny came today for us to talk about her book. We can't go back into talking about Will. Will, you're done. Okay, but I have so much to say to Will. <laughs> Will, I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> it's heart of the matter time. We've been glancing around this for a while now. Lanny, I think what makes you unique, uh, even in relation to Will and Norman, or maybe not Norman, is that this is clearly the first thing that you have ever written. Yeah, I think Norman and Lanny have something in common. <laughs> the, well, okay, but Norman, Norman makes up for it with his batshit crazy voice. And I mean that as a compliment, Norman. Like, even if it... it it, it comes off as outsider art. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's auteur. It's auteur. Lanny, I, I mentioned you are the reason that I started English Club. Because I saw myself in you reading your book. There's this uncanny feeling that you understand what a book should be. But when it comes down to the brass tacks of the mechanics, you're a little bit rusty. The, there's these vestigial scenes, like we mentioned, they met Carrot Top, and it was just a, hi, how are you? How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good to see you. And there, there are these scenes that exist, and they don't serve a narrative function. There are these overblown physical descriptions where she uses a mirror, and she looks at herself, and she describes, I don't think I'm pretty, even though other people think I'm pretty. I have crazy colored hair, and I don't have a thigh gap. Yeah, I mean, for God's sakes, the first five pages are a description of herself, and I think a full page is dedicated to the fact that her hair has three colors in it. Right, right. But that's something that a person who wants to be a writer but hasn't necessarily gone through the ringer and really sat down and analyzed the structure of a story would be given to do. Uh, Talk about um, outsider art, auteur kind of thing. There are these little things, while they're unique... Only someone who is not a writer or doesn't, you know, think too much about literary things would would think that it's a, well, to be honest, would think that it's a good idea. Like the fact that every perspective that isn't Zade's is completely in italics. Or the, and they lived happily ever after, dot, dot, dot. Or do they? These are things that are only something that someone who is not used to writing would incorporate in a book. Okay, I think, I, I think I'm picking up what you're putting down. I just, I just wish that you had gone through an editor or maybe some more beta readers or, or something before publishing this because within this story is the, the vague idea of a really compelling narrative, possibly. Yeah, I agree. It's just undermined by these, these missed beats, you know? Yeah, there's conceptually a lot uh, working here. And I think that's something we've even said sort of implicitly throughout our, our sort of discussion here so far. You know, conceptually, at least I've been hearing myself say that, this is a cool idea. Conceptually, it's cool that her parents are alive. Conceptually, it's a cool idea that she's a real magic user in this world full of fake magic users and she has to hide herself. Mm -hmm. Uh, Conceptually, it's cool that Mac has to stab her in order to save her, but in execution, it just doesn't quite hang together. And that's not your fault, Lanny. At least it's not the, the amount of your fault that people on the internet are telling you it is. You're just not mature as a writer yet. And I, I just really hope that you're not discouraged. I hope one day to see a new book from you. Because cause this, this could be cool. Another thing that I think could use some improvement is the lack of a clear antagonist. Maybe you would disagree with this, Andrew. I mean, having no antagonist isn't in and of itself a bad thing. There's lots of YA novels that don't have a clear antagonist and have become staples of the, the YA bookshelf. Mm-hmm. Um, I've mentioned The Catcher in the Rye before. This is the third time. I love that book. I'm going to continue mentioning The Catcher in the Rye in every meeting of St. Balasar University English Club just because now it's a thing. The conflict 
if there's not going to be a single antagonist, it could be external, but come from like a societal issue. It's not a single person. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the hate you give, say, had one of those. Um, yeah. <laughs> the magic girl that we get in the parking garage is the closest thing we have to an antagonist. Mm-hmm. Um, but she shows up all of like twice. Right. And it's never, she doesn't even have a name. Uh, she mm-hmm. feels like she exists, like she's checking the box of have conflict rather than like participating in the plot of the story. Uh, forgive me for saying this, but it felt kind of like an anime. <laughs> it did kind of feel like an anime. I, I can forgive you for that because it's kind of true. Like the way she pops up and she's just like, well, 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 Zaid, <laughs> here we are. And Zaid's like, who are you? <gasps> and then they have a big energy beam fight. Right. <laughs> I do agree with you that it lacked a conflict. I am hesitant to say lacks a villain for the reasons that you just said. There are a couple missed opportunities for conflict that didn't get fleshed out where they could have been. Some of it was just, uh, I'm just going to be honest, Landy, it was just a failure of your writing. The, The romantic conflict didn't sell the entire rest of the novel just because of various weaknesses in the characters or their relationships. I mean, the reason that the love triangle doesn't sell it is because, like you said, there's no love triangle. The Jackson leg of the triangle doesn't really exist um, past the point where Jackson is initially introduced. Right. And it's it's really clearly, like, foreshadowed that he's going to be the rival to Mac, but then the rest of the book just doesn't do that. Right, exactly. I'll get into this later, but the theater company kind of just existed and there were no rival theater companies or misfortunes that befell the Spellman company other than, you know, the, the occasional accident. Okay, wait, rival theater company. I hadn't even thought of that as a as a potential driving conflict, but that actually strikes me as really cool. Right, yeah. And she they have this secret weapon of Zaid, who's like a real magician. Yeah, and then they if they wanted to be kind of corny about it, they could do a double twist where Zaid's uh, sort of counterpart in the evil magic company is also magic user or something like that. Ooh. And it's the woman from the parking lot. Uh, that might be too obvious. Too obvious for a handbook for mortals. Well, okay, what about this? What if it's a stage magic user so talented that it appears to be real magic? Oh, ooh, like a Superman Lex Luthor thing. Um, I'm not a nerd. Lex Luthor resents Superman because Lex Luthor is a self-made man, whereas Superman was born with powers or whatever. Wait, really? Is that what Lex Luthor's all about? I heard it on a YouTube video once. I don't I don't read comic books, but I've heard that one time. Okay, that's true. I actually love that. Yeah, so there could be like a, a really talented fake, like Chris Angel. If you're going to put Carrot Top in here, you're going to have Chris Angel just hates Lanny, uh, not Lanny Serum, <laughs> Z- Zade Holder, because she... Scheherazade, she, please. Scheherazade. Sorry, I should be formal here. She, she, he hates Scheherazade because she because she was born with her powers and she didn't have to work for it. Yeah, okay, wait, no, this is actually getting better and better the more we talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like this idea that, like, there's a stage magic user who's so talented that even other stage magic users can't figure out her tricks. Yeah. And this person somehow figures out that Zade is using real magic and holds that over her head, sort of maybe blackmailing her. Finds her handbook for mortals. She finds the handbook for mortals. <laughs> and maybe they become friends. Like, what if Zade did a, a tarot reading for this person? That might be interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what if this person was like, hey, Zade, I totally hate you, but you have real magic, so like, Tell me about the future. Who wins in the big contest between our two magic companies? But that's the thing, is that her tarot card reading abilities are limited by the the heart of the cards. So she's not going to be able to accurately predict the future. And maybe that could be another source of conflict. That's right. She turns over five cards, and what is that? It's the five pieces of Exodia. (laughs) (laughs) I said no anime. (laughs) I bit my lip. Do you, um, do you ever get weird feelings? You know, like a premonition? He nodded his head slightly before answering me. Sure, everyone does. Usually they're unfounded. People listen too much to their feelings instead of facts. Yeah, so, um, during the break there, just a second ago, I actually went and looked at my copy of Trigger Warning to see where they talked about Die Hard. You're right, they did. Um, It was actually during the second scene where Jake is getting the crap beat out of him by a bunch of, like, masked thugs. And one of them is weird, so, like, the gang... And I'm surprised it didn't actually come up during our our review, but, like, 
the gang like stops because one of them is like, hey guys, hold on a second. And the guy's like, so by the way, have you seen Die Hard? And Jake is like, no, I haven't. Why do you ask? And the guy's like, oh, I just think you'd really like it. It's like, seems like it'd be up your alley. And Jake's like, oh, okay, cool. And then he like puts it down in his letterboxed app and then they proceed to like kick in a bunch. <laughs> So, back to Lanny. There are a couple missed opportunities here, and we wanted to kind of give you some suggestions for where to take this that would be in line with your vision, but also would help make this a stronger narrative. Joshua, you're going to instantly shoot me down for this, but I absolutely believe that this book wasn't generic enough. All right, keep talking. I, I mean, I have one loaded in the barrel, but keep talking. <laughs> what I mean by that, Lanny, is uh, you need to take a page out of Trigger Warning. You need... Wait, that's how guns work, right? You load it right into the barrel, like from the Depends front. on the kind of gun. Okay. Oh, I'll ask Jake. Okay. Yeah, ask Jake. Um, you need story beats. You need a pyramid of action. Honestly, just slap some Save the Cat beats onto this. There's so much opportunity when you have this premise of someone running away to a magical new world for a fish-out-of-water premise. Like, fun in games. Let's see her doing the real magic. And through these fun and games, we'll be learning about the, the limitations and capabilities of your powers. We never see Zade adjust to this big new life. And Lanny, we get your insight into this, but Zade's never adjusting to it. That gives us room to shoehorn in character interaction we could justify Sophia hating her. Maybe Zade's just incompetent at something and it messes up something that Sophia's trying to do. Mac and Jackson's love triangle could be galvanized by some scenes of them teaching her something about the show business. And what I, I think makes this a good starting point for edits is that there are so many scenes that are just vestigial and just don't go anywhere that could be replaced by scenes that maybe serve this secondary purpose. I actually, instead of shooting you down, let me uh, pop that bullet out of there. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that you're right. We need like a section where she's learning how to do stage magic. And what you said about Sophia actually just struck a chord with me. I hadn't thought about this, but it actually sort of ties into it. A thought that I had um, that presumably there's going to be some circumstances in Zade's life where where real magic isn't going to cut it. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no conceivable way she could get away with doing real magic, and so she would have to actually learn some stagecraft. Hmm. And so I think the idea of a magic girl who's trying to learn fake magic is sort of weirdly compelling, yeah. because she'd be tempted at every step to, like, I don't know, shoot fire out of her hands or something. Mm -hmm. But, like, no, she actually has to learn how to do sleight of hand the real way, because real magical experts would, would be able to tell the difference. Yeah, and this could be a story of her learning to be more self-reliant, and we could keep the tent building scene. You know, she she waits until the middle of the night to finally make her tent, and she can't figure it out, and she just waves her hand, and it gets magically assembled for her. That could be emblematic of a change that she has along and along as she's learning, okay, I can't just poof everything I want into existence. Sometimes I should work for the things I want. That would be compelling. Yeah, maybe maybe magic is a crutch for her. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She she I mean she obviously has character flaws, but she could she could use some, you know, specific and compelling character flaws that could play into the narrative. That would be that'd be really cool. Yeah, so I think this this ties in well to something we were talking about earlier. If magic is a crutch for her, then the natural next step we need is a character to sort of be there to remind her not to use it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think our extremely skilled fake magic user who uh, knows that she's using real magic and is blackmailing her right. is a good candidate for that. This rival magic company magician sure. who's like, I'm, I'm watching you. Like, if you use real magic, I'm going to know and I'm going to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. That would force Zade to like either become much more tricky about when she's using real magic or mm -hmm. to actually just learn how to use stage magic. I mean, if you want to be really lazy, Lanny, what you can do is don't have a rival company. Just have Sophia find something that, like, be like, I'm on to you and have that be your source of conflict. It doesn't necessarily have to be completely external to Zade's entire world. Okay, yeah, that's actually much more expedient. See, there you go. Yeah, Sophia would be would be a good pick for that. And, and, and there we could have some additional conflicts because... 
Zade's like, hey, you're fucking my dad. And that makes me uncomfortable. That was... And Sophia's like, what are you going to do about it? It would be so nice to have that acknowledged. So around the time that Carrot Top showed up, I got to thinking, all this stuff is really, really lame to me. Like, I don't care about stage magic. Like, there's Penn and Teller, there's Chris Angel, but, like, this isn't Broadway or Los Angeles or, you know, everyone wants to be an actor or a movie star or a, 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 a guy in a band. Like Jackson? Uh, like Jackson. Everyone wants to be Jackson. Who wants to be Mac? There's nothing inherently, even, even Zayd. Who wants to be Zayd? There's not a lot very compelling about this to, to me as I, i'm speaking completely from my own perspective like in in the real world i don't think i would ever spend money on seeing a magic show so that got me to thinking if you don't want a villain and you want another source of conflict what if charles spellman is the captain of a sinking ship like he's on like a d-tier magic company and it it's just failing financially. Nobody's coming to this. You can reframe this relatively easily, in my opinion, as an underdog sports story. You know, this this failing company takes a chance on this hick woman from the middle of nowhere, and it turns out that she's actually very talented, and she becomes, like, the, their secret weapon. But it's not enough to keep them afloat. And no matter how amazing Zade's tricks are, it's still just a stupid magic show. Okay. Um, Lonnie, I'm going to tell it to you straight. I would not read the book that Andrew has just proposed, but I think there's somebody that would. There's a problem in the third act when Zayd uses chaos magic for no reason and has never expressed a desire to tamper with these things before. She just does it. So I was trying to think about ways I could justify her doing that. And maybe, maybe the Spellman Company is on its last legs and they need something really amazing. And the only way that she can do it is by tampering with these forces that she doesn't quite understand. But she loves these people and she wants this company to succeed so bad that she adds this extra element of chaos magic into her trick and everything else can stay the same from there. But no, wait, better idea. What's that? She tampers with chaos magic, which she doesn't understand and can't control. And instead of her being injured, Mac or Jackson is injured. Okay, that works too. Because that way, that way we have our main character, our point of view character, being the point of view character mm -hmm. to the end of the book. Uh, that way we have a character that feels responsible for her actions, a character that has agency, a character that has to make actual decisions about what to do next and how to follow up on the things that she screwed up. Yeah. And that can tie into your idea of her kind of learning that magic is a crutch. She sees how unfettered magic can really hurt other people, and it adds a little bit of humanity to her. Yeah, and then I guess the natural conclusion is then at the end she saves Mac's life by doing some stage magic really good, and he's just so impressed that he snaps out of his coma. <laughs> you know what I mean, you know what I mean. She, she <laughs> comes to this conclusion <laughs> after saving Mac with magic, so... Max just laying there like on a cot and she's like, was this your card? Was this your card? <laughs> okay, okay, so there's some things you gotta iron out in terms of the logistics, but it would, I don't know. No, no, I hijacked your idea and then crashed it right straight into the ground so you can carry on from where you were going originally. No, I'm still hung up. Why, why do you think it would detract from the novel to have Charles Spellman running a failing company? That's, that's what I'm concerned about. Let me, let me step back. That might be a novel that could win me over with time. That would not be a novel that I would pick up in a store, read the the dust jacket, and then purchase. Failing Magic Company just doesn't, it just doesn't grab me in the same way that Girl with Real Magic has to learn how to do fake magic does. That's fair. That's fair. It just doesn't have the, it doesn't have the immediate sort of zing. But it has more, I would say it has a, it has more literary potential. That's true. I've kind of ruined myself by studying business here at St. Balasar University because that's the kind of stories that I want to know. I want to know about failing companies. I don't care about magic. You want to hear about uh, Charles Spellman's accounting practices I, and why they are flawed. I want to know whether he uses accrual accounting or cash based. I also want to know that thing that I understand what you just said. <laughs> so Lonnie, which is it? Does he use the cruel accounting? <laughs> the cruel accounting? 
<laughs> All accounting is cruel, let me tell you. Maybe maybe that's hey Charles, maybe your business was failing because you were using cruel accounting. Did you ever think about using a different method? Oh my god. My anger erupted. If she hadn't been my mother, I probably would have punched her. I couldn't believe she was pulling such nonsense again. It was an age-old excuse. I want to protect you for making the mistakes I made. I started to grind my teeth. If I had been a cartoon, smoke would have been coming out of my ears. I began to wave my hands in exasperation, a habit I had gotten from her. Stop! I shouted in anger. I don't want to hear it. I'm not you. I inhaled deeply and tried to relax. I have my own life, and I think you were really selfish for what you did. She winced, wounded. The truth hurts, or so she'd always told me. I walked around the car and opened the driver's side door. I gotta go. I'm too upset to continue this conversation. I couldn't deal with it anymore. If I let my wall down, I would just stay. Forever. I couldn't do that. We both stood, staring at each other. Part of me wanted to push my mom out of the way and jump in the car, but I couldn't be that mean to her. It felt like we stood there for hours. Finally, she just said, Please. It was all she could say. Her voice cracked, and pain showed on her face. You know what else would be cool? Since Lanny seems to want Zade's mom to still be alive, and since she's introduced at the beginning of the novel as a source of conflict, I think it would be natural for her mom to be a continual source of conflict throughout the novel. Yeah. That's sort of the natural next step, I think. If you're gonna have a parent alive in a YA novel, there's there should be a good reason for it. I mean, there's a good reason that parents aren't alive in YA novels, so if you're gonna subvert that trope, there should be a, a use of it, I think. A use of that subversion. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe she's not a threat throughout the entire story, but I think there's maybe space in here for maybe a few couple chapters where her mom shows up in Vegas and is like, hey, I'm here to bring you home. Oh, yeah. And maybe it's at a time when Zade is feeling vulnerable and, and she's tempted to do that. What do you think? That's actually really cool Um, because it's made to seem like the relationship between Zade and her mother is a lot more complicated and nuanced than it ends up being in the later half of the book. Like you said, YA protagonist's parents are dead for a reason, so I'm worried about the idea of shoehorning her, but if we could tie that in organically to some part of the larger conflict, I think that would be really cool as an opportunity. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just feel like if you're going to subvert that, that sort of expected norm, then you should do it for some reason. And right now, the only reason that her mom stays alive is so that she can be there at the end to marry Charles and to help save Zade's life. Right. Which, uh, I don't know, it's subjective, but to me those just aren't good enough reasons to keep her alive. You could have somebody else for those roles. It's, it's entirely dependent on the execution here. I could see it being very disastrous, but it's, it's worth a shot. Uh, yeah, it could totally be a distraction, her mom showing up and trying to bring her home. Uh, but I don't know, something, to, something about that just calls to me, like, Zade's at a low point. Uh, she's maybe realized she can't save the failing magic company. Right. And her mom is like, hey. Uh, she <laughs> Zade texts her mom is like, mom, I'm scared. Could you come pick me up from Las Vegas? <laughs> yeah. And her mom is like, sure, honey. Yeah. Here, let me just warp there. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be, there needs to be, um, so rule of threes in any conflict, you have the triumph, tragedy, transcendence. Uh, Zade triumphs and leaves behind the the bad world and goes to the good world, and then at the end, transcendence in the form of her parents are getting married and everything's happily ever after. But there's there needs to be. I think I think we could stand to add one scene, one good scene with her, or one good segment with the mother, um, coming back and trying to trying to mess with the status quo. I think it's worth a shot, Lanny. And Lanny. Lanny does kind of make an effort to include that in her own little way. Yeah. Because uh, there is that one section of the chapter that's entirely in italics where it's just Zade's mom doing a tarot reading of her own. Right. Um, trying to get trying to get a bead on her daughter's status. So, like, it's another instance where, like, you get the sense that Lanny, like, kind of gets how these sorts of plots are supposed to work, but then just misses the execution by a hair. That's That's kind of the perennial problem. Misses it by a hair. I think that's what makes it so so fascinating sure. for 
for readers who are also aspiring writers. Mm -hmm. but I think, like, like you said, they see a lot of themselves in this. This is everybody's first novel, essentially. Lanny just had the misfortune of <laughs> having hers published. Ugh. I feel bad for you, Lanny. Yeah, yeah, in a weird way, it's like, it's so raw. <laughs> it's just and gritty I don't just mean and that. compelling. <laughs> I mean, it's not. It's not either of those things. It's just like, <laughs> you, you can tell she really, she really cared. And I mean, there's no greater testament to that than <laughs> the acknowledgement section at the end of the book. It goes on for like 20 pages and it's just full of names. It's full of names. Hold on. Let me count them. Okay, it goes on for 11 pages. On every page, there's like three paragraphs, and every single one of those paragraphs contains one to seven names of people that inspired her. And so, like, you can just tell. Like, a lot of love went into this book. Oh, yeah. I just wish that it hadn't attempted to achieve greatness by such underhanded means, mm -hmm. and it had just let itself be what it is which is somebody's first novel that just faded into obscurity yeah i mean it, it's sad that first novels have to be like that but mm -hmm. it's just sort of the nature of the beast in a way it's a rite of passage kind of weird i feel like it's a situation that's it's almost exclusive to writing at least as far as i know uh, i mean nobody nobody out there is trying to publish their first drawing as a work of art you know oh no but but people write their first novel and for some reason they have this perception that it's going to change the literary status quo um for better or for worse mm -hmm. um and there's a reason those things usually don't get published because no matter how much passion goes into them they're just they're just frankly not that good technically speaking right well yeah and, and i, I want to stress that it's a technical thing like I don't think even the best version of Handbook for Mortals is going to completely rewrite the literary scene of the United States. But who among us is going to do that? Like, that's not something that you should aspire to. What I mean is there's there's a good enough story in here that could have stood on its own legs. It's not like this is just a completely irredeemable story. No, to the contrary. I would argue that of the three books we've read so far, this is probably the most fixable. Right. Of the three books we've read in our entire lives. Well, you've read four, Catcher in the Rye. The Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, well, I also have read Kafka's America, as okay. you know from last episode, because I called something Kafka-esque. Um, <laughs> so I have read that. Which can only so mean... five books. Which can only mean that you have read Kafka's <laughs> works. Um, well, no, I have to say that I've read Kafka's America, because if I say I've read Kafka, people are like, oh, have you read The Metamorphosis? And I'm like, no, I've read Kafka's America. And they're like, what's that? And I'm like, you'd know if you're a real Kafka fan. I guess I guess I'm not. No, you're not. So so step off. <laughs> you could see Mac hadn't truly taken in all the words she had just pushed through his mind. He just sat there for a few moments before wondering out loud, "Like the TV show Charmed Witches?" Mac asked warily. "Oh no, that show got to be pretty silly." They did get some things right, like the power of three. We do a lot in threes. Ever seen a movie called Practical Magic with Sandra Bullock? Yeah, I think so. Mac nodded. Much more like that. Actually, I am almost sure a real practicing witch either wrote that or helped write that, though a real witch probably wrote Charmed too. Lanny, we've reached the end of our time together. I hope that we've given you enough to work with when you're moving on in your writing career. Is this ever going to be the kind of seminal work that will change the literary fabric of America like like Norman Bhutan's Empress Teresa? I honestly I honestly don't think it could ever get to that point, but I think inside of this book is something that could be very compelling and very entertaining. Something magical, you might say. I thought I told you to get rid of him, Joshua. I'm sorry, he just won't leave. Well, let's close the book on this one. Oh, a pun. As always. Do you get it? We're closing as always, the book. As always, I've been your host, Andrew. And I've been Charles Spellman. Thank you for listening. Please make sure to follow us, uh, like us, share us with your friends. Thank you, as always, to the illustrious Benjamin Davis for the music. And... 
we'll see you around campus. And thank you, Charles Spellman, for guest starring on this episode. The real Charles Spellman, at the real Charles Spellman on Instagram, and uh, Mr. Spellworks. <laughs> All right, bye, guys. Think there's a book or something out there? Mac asked. Book? I turned to clarify whether I had heard the right word. I wasn't sure what he needed a book for, because I had already caught the bouquet. Yeah, you know, like a handbook for mortals. Just so I could keep up. He grinned and winked at me. I smiled back. I'll try to find you one. And they lived happily ever after. Or do they?